Hello everyone. Uh, this time around I'm going to talk a little bit about a, a project I undertook some years ago. Now there was a, a game for the Radio Shack Color Computer back in the early 80s called Dungeons of Daggereth. Now it was a Basically, it was a first-person shooter type game before first-person shooters were really a thing. It, it came up with uh, a first-person 3D perspective on the dungeon you're walking through. Uh, you had a display that showed what was in each hand. You had a backpack you could stow stuff in and uh, mount a torch on. Uh, so your hands would be free for what was in them. It actually didn't do the floating inventory gag that so, that so many uh, so many things do, or the three or five or seven hands thing. And right dead center above a four line command entry area was a beating heart. Yeah, you know, tick 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 tick. That it that was absolutely brilliant because it, it given that this was. Uh, monochrome line art for the uh, graphics and it was three-dimensional so uh, stuff actually had perspective uh, but given that it didn't look particularly real but that beating heart was enough to give you that sense of immersion uh, the game itself has five levels uh, the first three are pretty standard. You wander around, you kill things, you climb down, you wander around, you kill more things, you climb down. And then uh, to get from the third to the fourth level, you have to kill a particular monster. Basically, it's a boss battle. And then you get to that fourth level, and the game gets about a thousand times harder. And then you wander around, you collect some stuff, you know, you kill some creatures... Then you go down to level 5 and you do the same thing. And then you face the final boss battle, which is actually quite a bit harder than the first one. And assuming you win that, then you get the fancy, hey, you've won screen, and you get the satisfaction of having beat the game. Now, the game itself is definitely beatable. You, you can, with sufficient effort, win the game. And you can do that reliably, actually, although you can get some seriously unlucky uh, rolls of the, the dice, so to speak, that make it really difficult in certain circumstances. The game itself is actually pretty simple. Uh, it, you wander around, you wail on things, uh, everything you kill, you get stronger from killing it, and... You collect gear, torches, and swords, and shields, and all that jazz, and you make your way through, you, you collect what you need. It's actually a pretty simple game overall, as far as the rules go. But it's surprisingly hard, and that is really its charm. Now, it is distributed as a ROM cartridge for the color computer. It required a 16K RAM machine, uh, mostly because the graphics screens it used need 6K each. And it, it actually turns out it uses two of those. I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, now, some time ago, the, the creators of the game did put out a note that if anyone who wanted the source code could obtain it for the cost of actually photocopying it and shipping it. Uh, it turned out that they had a printout of the source. I attempted to do that, uh, although it was many years after the offer was made, and I didn't get any response. Now, because of that, and because of the way the uh, license grant was worded, I, I realized that it would probably be okay legally to disassemble the game, the 8K ROM code, disassemble it and distribute that. Uh, so I did that. Now I attempted to disassemble Dungeons of Daggereth many, many years ago when I was in high school. 
and I got stymied. Uh, I ran into something, and I, I couldn't quite work out how to get past that. And I think that was partly inexperience and partly I just didn't understand what I was looking at. And that was basically my fault. I didn't study it carefully enough to understand what was going on. I did get so very close to figuring it out back then, though. But it's not the game itself that I want to talk about this time. It's the process of disassembling and reverse engineering it, and some of the things that I found while I was doing that. The, the thing that was easy to get started with, uh, the first thing I did was get a physical dump of the, the ROM, the uh, actual bytes in the 8K ROM. I just, I dumped that out. That was easy to obtain. Uh, I dumped that out to uh, uh, the data file. Uh, way back in the day the first time, I actually printed that out. And then what I did is I looked at the firmware in the machine and looked at how it launches these, these uh, game ROMs. And I learned that control transfers to the first byte in the ROM. So I, I knew that had to be valid instructions. So I started disassembling there and I worked through. And it was pretty clear, it was easy going. I found a whole bunch of instructions and I found references to uh, data tables used to initialize things. And I found uh, references to uh, interrupt handlers and things like that just based on knowing how the firmware in the machine actually operates. So I was able to uh, discover the initialization sequence and follow that code and how it operated. And I was able to identify how it differentiated between the demo game and launching a real game. So that was easy enough to do. The part where I ran into trouble back the first time and even later on is when I ran into this sequence of code that didn't make sense. Now the 6809 processor in the color computer has, an instru has several instructions called software interrupts. Now these instructions don't take any parameters. So when you encounter one, the byte following it should be another machine language instruction. It should be a valid instruction. And following that, you should get a valid instruction stream. But I didn't. Instead, I got what looked like random bytes after this particular one. Now, I knew from OS 9 programming, that's not the Mac OS 9, this is, uh, this is the operating system from Microware. Uh, I knew from that that it was fairly common practice to use a software interrupt instruction followed by a system call number, and then the routine for handling the software interrupt instruction would then fetch the routine re requested, that byte following, and adjust the return address on the stack so that when the routine exited, it started up with the next byte. So I thought, oh, hey, that's probably what's going on here. And that did get me past some of that. But I discovered there was one call that didn't seem to behave right. So I should have seen uh, the software interrupt instruction, an operation code, and then a, a, a proper code stream following after that. But I didn't. Uh, instead, I saw what appeared to be a random sequence of bytes, and it wasn't clear where the end of that random sequence of bytes was.
Well, that got me completely stymied, and I never did get past that, although I did find a whole bunch of other bits of code in the ROM, and I did manage to disassemble the software interrupt handling routine, since that had to have been initialized before the first call to one of these routines happened. So I knew that the interrupt routine had to have been set up before then. So I traced the code, followed it around, looked at data tables, figured out what actually set that up, and that got me the uh, interrupt handler table. So I was able to identify the IRQ handler. I was able to identify the software interrupt handlers, and there was there were uh, two of them. There was uh, the software, there was a plain software interrupt, and then there was a, a software interrupt two. There, these are two separate instructions in the processor. The one of them was used to vector calls into the ROM, and I'm not convinced that was actually net beneficial uh, to the uh, game code, although given that it needed to adjust the environment fairly substantially, it may actually have been beneficial to do it that way. Uh, certainly the code was shorter and I think that was the reason that they did it that way. And that's probably also why the other software interrupt routine collection was done the way it was as well because then instead of a subroutine call instruction which takes three bytes they could use a software interrupt instruction followed by a code which was two bytes. And there must have been a net win to the code size even when you accounted for the, the routine jump table and the actual software interrupt routine handler. That must have ended up with more compact code. Uh, information available uh, to me uh, when I started disassembling this again uh, some years ago said that they had actually had to make a substantial effort to shrink uh, the game code to fit within 8k uh, that they couldn't use the full 16k ROM space that would theoretically have been available. So I was able to find these interrupt handling routines and I was able to identify the software interrupt handling routines. And I was also able to identify the particular routine that had the problematic invocation. And I could see from the routine that it was taking data immediately following the routine itself and using that as an input to another routine. So I could see that. What I didn't understand the first time around is what that was doing how that was being decoded into something useful. And it turns out it was actually a really clever scheme that was used all over the ROM. Uh, they used a sort of um, five-bit packing scheme, and that was used mostly for text, but it was also used for font data uh, because this whole thing was on a graphic screen. They needed bitmap font data to display text. So what this worked out as, you'd have a number of codes, a number of numbers in the sequence, and that would be the first 5-bit value. Following that would be the rest of the 5-bit values, all packed from left to right within the bytes, with the last byte being padded with, with zero bits, although it didn't really matter what was there because those would be ignored. So then you'd have, so basically you'd have bits seven, six, five, four, and three would be, of the first byte, would be the number of codes to decode. And then you'd have bits two, one, zero of the first byte and 7 and 6 of the second byte would be the next code, and so on and so forth. And the routine for decoding it was quite clever. It used jump tables and a state byte and, and some stuff like that. 
And I got lost following that the first time through, and I didn't really understand what I was looking at. But once I understood it, once I figured it out and understood it, suddenly I was able to at least manually decode the sequence of bytes following this particular uh, software interrupt call and identify where the next actual machine code instruction would pick up after it. And that was absolutely groundbreaking in the process of decoding everything. So that allowed me to decode the main mainstream sequence of instructions and all of that. And eventually I got the majority of the ROM decoded just by following that stuff around. I also identified some uh, code sequences that weren't directly referenced by uh, a jump instruction or what have you, uh, by sheer accident, seeing what was clearly a sequence of instructions in the in the the ROM dump. And when I I did that, I realized that there was a whole lot of code that was being referenced, but it wasn't being called directly. And that was a major breakthrough as well uh, when I figured that out. Uh, and that really came when I figured out how the scheduling system in Daggereth works. Daggereth has several uh, clocks uh, that run simultaneously. Uh, they are timed in a number of number of IRQ ticks, which uh, on most systems would be 60 ticks per second, roughly. And it's timed on that, and each time... And then it has a list of events that have been registered. And as each item ticks down, each clock ticks down, then... Items on the particular wait queue for that, uh, that clock have their wait time ticked down, and when they hit zero, uh, or b the bottom, then they're moved from the wait queue to the overall run queue. It's a scheduler. And then the main loop of the game is uh, an infinite loop that just runs... It does a little bit of bookkeeping at the start of the loop. And then it cycles through all of the, the things in the run queue and executes them all at once in sequence in the order that they were popped off the run queue or popped onto the run queue rather. And then it goes back, you know, it does a little bit of stuff and then it keeps, it keeps doing this in a loop. So the whole game is run off of interrupt timing, okay? And once I figured this out and identified the scheduling queue data structures and all of that, and I looked, I figured out how they were being initialized when a game was started, I was able to finally identify all of the rest of the machine code in the system. And once I did that... Now I had a, the ability to get a complete disassembly of the ROM. And it revealed that the scheduling system was in, immensely clever. It also showed that the game itself was not really impacted all that much by the CPU clock speed. So it showed me that the game itself could run reliably with the CPU running in double speed mode on Cocos that could handle that. Okay, so I was able to decode the whole thing, everything from the command interpreter to the creature handlers to uh, torches counting down to all of that stuff. I was able to to decode all of that, and I got a basically complete de 
disassembly of the ROM, except for the sound routines, which were pretty crazy, and that took a little bit of work to figure out what they were doing, as they were doing some really weird stack modifications and things like that, and most of that was just to compact it down. You could see they got a substantial win from compacting all of that down. Uh, even now, even though I've been able to add comments to all that code that kind of gives you an idea what it's doing, I don't really understand how it's, it's doing what it does, but it is absolutely fascinating how it generates the bleeps and bloops and, and blats and all of that that make up the creature sounds and so on in the dungeon. And how it does it without sounding quite so synthetic. Uh, it, it's really impressive. So I decoded that, and, and that was great, and that pretty much decoded the, all of the data. Uh, there was one other bit that was really, really fascinating when I worked out how it worked, and that was the line graphics rendering system. It actually stores the line graphics. It's a set of vector graphics, uh, essentially. It's encoded primarily as points uh, in a fixed size uh, grid. And then when it's drawn, the points are scaled based on a scaling factor which determines the distance from the viewer. And that's what gives that three-dimensional vanishing point in the dungeon rendering. Now, there were some complications in the graphic rendering, but this was actually, uh, I think, the first really, really significant routine that I was able to decode. And it was really, really impressive. The is not only did it handle scaling the graphics, it handled spacing the points out on lines. Because uh, so, as the thing became less distinct, it did that by spacing out the points in the lines. And, and that actually is surprisingly effective. So uh, it uh, is a really impressive graphic rendering, uh, especially the fact that it operated on fixed point fractions. And it made brilliant use of the multiply instruction in the 6809 processor. So the graphic rendering routine is absolutely brilliant. Combine that with the double buffering technique it was using. Uh, basically, it would build a, a screen for the display, set a flag, and then the 60 hertz interrupt would swap the... Uh, swap the screens, and then the next frame would be, be rendered, and it would be rendered uh, off screen. So you wouldn't get any tearing, you wouldn't see the screen getting painted as it got painted. So even though it might take five or six interrupts for a screen to be painted, depending on what it was displaying, you wouldn't see any of that. It would just pop up. And that was absolutely brilliant as well. And that's why it needed the 16K system. Uh, even if an 8K system were available, which it never was, uh, you would still not have been able to do this because you needed 12K for the graphics screens. So, Dungeons of Dagger, the code is really impressive, and, uh, and all of that. But how did I actually trace everything? Uh, how did I actually do the disassembly? And that is actually a, an interesting discussion all on its own. Uh, you might think that I fed it into a disassembler program and then fiddled with the disassembler until I got uh, reasonable output. But that turns out not to have been a practical uh, operation to do. I did try it, but it turned out that I, the, the way the code was structured, 
there was too much randomness in where the next instructions appeared, partly due to that software interrupt thing, and partly uh, due to just the way the code was laid out in the ROM. There was a lot of manual decoding needed anyway to figure out what was going on. Also, I needed to trace the code execution to find out where, where different parts of the code actually existed. And doing that, while you could do that with a disassembler, I didn't have one that had the ability to follow that. And on top of the additional wrinkles that this particular ROM had, it wasn't going to be terribly helpful to do that. What I ended up doing instead was disassembling it on paper by hand. Now that's a tedious process, but the way the 6809 processor operates, it's not nearly as tedious as it sounds because you very, very quickly start to recognize the patterns in the instruction encoding. So then you'll come across uh, you know, a, a, an instruction which uh, is the bytes E6 followed by uh, 8.4, and you'll recognize that is uh, load accumulator B with the value pointed to by index register X. So then you can just, okay, so it's LDB comma X. Great. Okay, so there's a lot of that stuff. It's really easy, and uh, once you, you get things going. And what I did is I had a worksheet uh, that I was using, which basically had a column for the address and a column for the uh, machine or the assembly actually a column for the address, a column for the bytes, and a column for the actual uh, disassembled code. So then any time I was coming along and I got a sequence of code uh, and then I hit something that didn't look like code, I would put that sequence of, of uh, worksheets aside I'd look through it to see where I had something that I hadn't already disassembled, that uh, an address reference. And then I would start disassembling from that address reference on another sheet and keep on going. Again, keeping track of address references and so on. And eventually I'd you end up with an address reference in the middle between other things that I'd already uh, decoded. So then I'd slot in more sheets there. And then eventually by the end of it, I had a stack of, uh, of these worksheets, something like that. And they all gave a unbroken uh, disassembly of the code for Dungeons of Dagareth not including the stack of data tables that existed at the end of the ROM, which included everything from the graphics data to certain waveform tables for sound and things like that. And then I, once I had that, I actually transcribed that into a text file on, on my computer, uh, which was in proper syntax and I imported in the data tables that were uh, that I, I converted mechanically into a series of data instructions and then I, I got it to the point where all of this together when run through an assembler gave a byte accurate version of the ROM so that when assembling it, I got the exact same ROM back out. Once I got to that point, I knew I had the basic assembly basically done. What was left over was identifying what the various variables meant in the, uh, in the data area. Uh, and I had to identify what various routines did. Uh, how they worked, uh, what the various things meant, 
and I had to work out what all of those massive data tables in the upper ROM meant. So that was the last step, and it was also the longest step of disassembling Dungeons of Daggerith. Uh, and this was essentially the final reverse engineering step. I had to study the code, figure out what it was doing, uh, tracing ROM calls, figuring out what all of it was doing, and then eventually turning that into a description of how the game operated. Uh, some of the easy stuff to figure out were things like the command interpreting uh, scheme, where uh, like the jump table for that, once I identified that, uh, you know, I, I identified the handlers for the various commands. You could type in like climb and attack and all of that jazz. Uh, I also uh, ended up with the uh, routine, finally, when I figured out the routine that populated a level for the dungeon, uh, that revealed a whole bunch of how a whole, a whole whack of other code worked. And eventually, uh, it cascaded. Each routine that I was able to decode and understand would cause other routines to become clearer. And as that happened, I was able to identify variables and what they meant. And then if I ran into a routine that accessed that same variable, then I would have more clues to what that routine did. And eventually it all cascaded and I hit a breakover point and suddenly everything started to come together and make perfect sense. So basically, that's, that's the process when you need to reverse engineer, disassemble a, a program. It doesn't matter how big or complicated the program is. The process is the same. You have to identify what's code, what's data. You have to figure out what the code does, how it works, and how it relates to the rest of the code in the system. Dungeons of Daggereth is a, it's a masterpiece and it's only 8K of 6809 code and data. That's actually small as far as programs go, and it was pretty easy overall to decode, although I did have an advantage over a lot of reverse engineering projects in that I was able to take advantage of information available on the internet that describes certain aspects of how the game operates. Uh, some of this information was gleaned from source code that other people obtained from the actual uh, creators of the game, and that had some of the original comments in it, which meant they had a leg up in understanding it. And, and this was information that was able to uh, reveal certain aspects of certain parts of the code. Now, I did discover that some of this information was not quite accurate because the purveyors of the information, uh, particularly the creators of the PC port of Daggereth, used the intended formulas and so on rather than what was actually implemented in the game. And that's why the Daggereth PC port doesn't behave quite the same as the original game in certain circumstances. That doesn't mean that the PC port is not faithful to the original game. It is quite clearly the original game. Uh, potentially, with, you could uh, call it a version 2 with bugs fixed. Now, once I had this disassembly, I had this, this idea that I should be able to modify the source code so it'll run when loaded from a disk file. On a 32K system, there would be plenty of room for the 8K plus a bit code and the runtime data and the graphics screens and not interfere with the required data areas used by the disk basic ROM. And that turned out to be, in fact, true. Uh, 
And once I did that, I was able to also modify the game to save to disk instead of saving to tape. And I discovered issues with the way the game was actually saved. Uh, so I ended up I ended up building a, a whole set of load save routines and things like that. And I also needed a, a means of calling the basic ROM without it bailing out if an error occurred. And it turns out it was actually possible to do that. So I ended up with a version of Dungeons of Dagareth, which uh, while the original needed 16K of RAM, this needs 32K. But it's the same game, loaded from disk, with a little bit of expansion, such as a full ASCII coverage font, including lowercase, and uh, additional uh, details like that, and certain, and all of the fancy 5-bit encoding of strings and font data and so on has been removed, which actually makes aspects of the game run quite a bit faster. Uh, so, as, as things go, it was actually quite a fascinating project, and I ended up with a result that was uh, pleasing, really. And, you know, so as, as things go, uh, it was an educational experience as well. Uh, it really made it clear the processes that you really need to go through to disassemble and reverse engineer software. I can't imagine having to do that for code that's aimed at a modern system that was written in a programming language like C or, heaven forbid, C++ or something like that, and then compiled. Is decoding that and the sheer volume of code that you end up with for a lot of modern programs, that would just be insane. Uh, well, it's certainly possible to do. Uh, for most non-trivial programs, it's not worth it, uh, especially for programs where uh, you end up very easily seeing megabytes of actual code coming out of the compiler instead of a few kil kilobytes. So if you have to decode that by hand, you're going to have massive, massive, massive errors as a result. So it's, it's definitely worth avoiding having to do that, uh, if at all possible. And when something's compiled, uh, if there's no optimization done, you might be able to use some sort of a decompiler to get something that resembles source code back, but you're almost certainly not going to get anything useful. So you're still going to have a massive amount of work by hand to figure out what all of this stuff does. Dungeons of Daggerth, by contrast, is pretty small. Uh, even for the time, it was fairly small as programs go. Uh, for the complexity of what it does. So where do, what does that this mean overall? Well, you can definitely, uh, for older uh, pr uh, computer architectures at the very least, if you have old programs that you no longer have source code for, it's eminently practical to disassemble, decompile, reverse engineer, figure out how they all how they work get back something that while it's not the original source code is something that you can use for further development and it's actually worth doing even if it's something that you never distribute to anybody else you can learn amazing things about programming for that particular architecture even programming in general and you can often see the stuff that these modern computer science curriculums teach you about data structures and uh, scheduling algorithms and all of that, you can actually often see how that stuff was applicable even to those ancient computer platforms like the Color Computer and Dungeons of Daggereth. Uh, for instance, the scheduling process in there is absolutely brilliant. It's a simple round-robin scheduler, 
with multiple cues. But it's absolutely brilliant, and it is definitely a scheduler. So, you know, it's well worth studying old code. Uh, fortunately, if you want to just study Daggereth, you don't have to disassemble it anymore. I've already done that for you. And I'll try to put a link in the doobly-doo to the actual Daggereth disassembly uh, so that you can look at it if you like. If anybody else has stories of disassembling or reverse engineering software, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear about them. It's, it's a fascinating topic. Uh, if you want me to uh, uh, point off to something you've done, uh, drop me a note. Uh, uh, you know, drop me a put a comment on the video or uh, message me on the back of my channel here. Uh, I'd be fascinated to talk to or or with anybody who's been through this process uh, for any software. It's uh, you know, the pitfalls that you run into and the things that you learn is absolutely fascinating. So, that's really all I've got to say on the topic of disassembling Daggereth uh, for now. Uh, if you're interested in this type of thing, you'd like me to talk more about this sort of topic, uh, let me know. Uh, for now, though, that's all. And if you've watched this long, thanks for watching.